<laughs> so uh, I thought this was amusing because you know you're always hearing about uh, uh, fox breaking in the chicken house. Well, this fox did, and the chickens just said, "Bring it on!" and uh, and he died. They pecked him to death. Amen. And. <laughs> Now, now you know it's the, it's the, it's the uh, I mean, I mean the chicken eat the worms, poor worms. The fox eat the chickens, poor chickens. So they got things they they didn't read the the stuff. There, there's something they don't realize here about all of this. We're looking at the Act, Book of Acts. Now, now today's just uh, six verses, and the reason is because um, is because I um, looked at. This chapter, which I have separated out in Bible track, but it actually parlays into the first 11 verses of chapter 5, which is gory, just saying. And so I, I was going to have to deal with actually two different subject matters in one message and, and uh, 17 verses. So I decided, you know, we just do these verses today. It's the state of the early church that we're looking at right here. The church at Jerusalem, after just a few weeks, got thousands of people in the church after just a few short weeks. But that's not all. As a, as a matter of fact, just a few days later, uh, Peter and John get arrested for preaching. Uh, they preached. Uh, a guy got healed in chapter 3, been crippled from birth. And then in chapter 4, they were arrested by the temple authorities for doing something. And so they went to be locked up for the night. And after they were locked up, next morning they came out, uh, brought in before the, San, the, uh, well, the high priest and, and his family. And uh, they said, it, you got to stop this. You can't be preaching like this. And uh, they said, so my cho our choice is do we listen to you or do we listen to God? And they refused to stop preaching. And then they said in verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so they said, we're doing it anyway. Well, they threatened them further. And then let them go. I mean, what are they going to do? So, so they get back and everybody's pumped. I mean, everybody's excited. We went to prison. We spent the night. We just told them they could have killed us. They could have executed us like they did Jesus. But we just told them, no, we're not taking it. We're preaching. And uh, they let them go. So they get back. And the church is rejoicing. We saw that last week. They had this big prayer in verse 31, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they all filled the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. So here they're off this really, really big win. And uh, now, we're going to see a church that you say, now we don't, we don't do exactly that way. Well, what's up with that? And here's the thing about the early church. When Jesus left, they asked him in Acts 1, when he ascended, they said, Will you at this time restore the kingdom? Now what they were looking for was Jesus, for his three and a half years, said the kingdom of God is at hand. And what they knew it meant was what it meant from the Old Testament, and what they had taken it to mean was that Jesus Christ was going to rule on the earth as the Messiah, and he promised the twelve apostles that they'd sit on twelve thrones around him and they would rule the nations. So naturally, all right, we got that crucifixion thing out of the way. Jesus told us he had to do it and we thought maybe not, but he did. But then he resurrected and he's been with us for uh, 40 days teaching us. And so he's getting ready to ascend and they're saying, so now? I mean, like tomorrow do we start this? 
And he says, it's not for you to know the times of the season which the Father has put in his own power. But, verse 8, Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, which happened on the day of Pentecost, and you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, or to you, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So now if I'm there listening to that that day, you know what I'm thinking? I, we, we said, tomorrow the kingdom? He says, no, there's work to be done. you got to do this evangelistic thing after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So they're expecting the kingdom, the kingdom on earth that had been prophesied all the way back in the Old Testament. There, and I would be too. If I had listened to Jesus say those words, I would... I would fill in the holes in what he said, and I would say that means that when we're done, when we've done this missionary thing, he sent them off for two missionary journeys before. And uh, he sent them two by two, sent 12 two by two, then he sent 70 two by two. So they think, okay, we go do this, and when we are finished doing this, then we start the kingdom. Now that's what I would think, right? That's what you'd think. Now, there was no rapture taught at that point. Just, we're going to start the kingdom. All right, so uh, they're pumped. They, they, I mean, they are pumped. Um, if you knew that the rapture, the catching away, was going to take place on April 15th, would you do your taxes? <laughs> No, seriously, would you do them? Would you do them? Oh, I wouldn't mess them. Huh? <laughs> yeah. go, go, go ahead and... That would show some doubt, though. That would show some doubt. That, that, that'd show some doubt. I mean, I mean, now I wait to the 15th anyway. Actually, I get started usually around the 13th. Uh, but, uh, but, I mean, think, think about it. They're sure. They are sure the kingdom is right there. So, they're living their lives differently. I remember, uh, remember what you were doing October 23rd, 1962? I remember getting on the school bus that morning. It'll come to you in a minute. Thinking this may be the day that we all die. The president, President Kennedy, had gotten on TV the day before and said they were blockading, and it was just, it was feared that the missile, they had, they knew they had missiles aimed at us from Cuba, and we all thought, I mean, honestly, we got on the bus, it was solemn that morning. Usually we're throwing paper wads and cutting up, but that morning we all sat there and we honestly thought that we may not make it home from school. It's, it's an awesome feeling to think that you're going to die. Well, these people, they're, they're not going to die. They're going to start the kingdom. Nothing else matters. So you have to get the state of the church, the state of the mind of the people. They've gotten saved, and, and, uh, and here's, here's what they're thinking. Here's what they're living. So uh, the multitude of those who believed, were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. That's kind of an interesting scenario there. But before we get into the all things common part, let's talk about the state of the church, the multitude of those who believed. Here's the... Born again experience, Jesus so told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, Nicodemus, if you're not born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So then they have this discussion about what it means, and Jesus explains, Nicodemus, and I'm not talking about physical birth, I'm talking about spiritual birth. You've got to be born physically as well as spiritually, or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, at that point, Jesus established some guidelines. There is this experience. 
And it's an experience that Jesus verbalized himself with very specific terminology, and it's born again. I know that sounds old-fashioned. Well, it is. It goes all the way back to the first century A.D. And Jesus said this, you got to be born again. Nothing else will do. It's not how good you are. It's not where you've been. It's not the family you were raised in. It has nothing to do with any of those things. It did in Judaism, by the way. If you were born into a family that had a Jewish father, then you were born a Jew. Religiously and ethnically, you were a Jew in every sense of the word. But Jesus says, yeah, no, 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 that's not what this is. This is a personal experience of being born again. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which lives and abides forever. The early church was knit together as a body of born again believers. Those who believe. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that once you get saved, something supernatural happens. And I want to tell you, so many evangelical churches today have missed the supernatural aspect of salvation. And they have reduced it to a handful of magic words. Get them to say these words, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and they're good. But there's something supernatural about salvation. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for, for by one Spirit we are baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ. Hebrews 12, 23, the General Assembly, the body of Christ. That's the body of Christ. How would you get there? For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. And it says, doesn't matter, Jew, Greek, free, slave, all baptized by one Spirit. Spirit. So here's, here's the supernatural aspect of salvation. The first thing is when you need to be saved, you hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God convicts you. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit. John 6, says it like this. No man can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. That drawing is done by the Holy Spirit of God. It's supernatural. It's not just when I was with the parachurch group, the navigators, you know, we go through and we give our, give our plan of salvation, and then we say, it's a good deal, right? Well, this is what's called the presumptive close if you're buying a car or buying insurance. Good deal, right? Yeah, that's a good deal. I right, take my hand, pray after me, and repeat the words. And uh, wasn't taken. Well, why? Because salvation is when you're drawn by the Holy Spirit, and the act then is characterized by being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And after that point. Uh, Paul says in Romans 8 9, Now you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of Christ dwell in you, Holy Spirit. Now, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Now, the Holy Spirit, I need you to agree with me, the Holy Spirit's supernatural. It's not of this natural world. The Holy Spirit is what indwells you, it's the difference between a saved person and a lost person. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now once the Holy Spirit gets into you, He's going to nag you to death. He's going to nag you about living the Christian life ethically, properly, spiritually. And we're given all kinds of... Uh, of instructions of how that takes place in Galatians chapter 5 and 6. So, people then have to realize that, well, first of all, all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23, Romans 3, 10. Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. We all, we all, I don't care what kind of, of 
genetics you have, I don't care what kind of family you came from, all have sinned, we're all born sinners. That means we're born with this propensity to sin. We're not sinners, hasn't committed a sin, not a single sin at the point of birth. But that newborn baby is born with a propensity to sin, and we call it the Adamic nature, because the scripture calls it the Adamic nature. So we're born with this propensity to sin. That's why we're all sinners. That's why we've fallen short of the glory of God. But there's worse news than that. And it's in Romans 6.23 where it says, For the wages of sin is death. Now it's spiritual death. And I had, I've had numbers of people say, Wayne, you don't know what spiritual death is. Yeah, I do. Well, it doesn't say spiritual death. Yes, it does. It says spiritual death because the verse goes on. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if the life it's talking about is spiritual life, then the death it's talking about is spiritual death. And here's what it says. Because I'm a sinner, I deserve to be eternally separated, to be dead to God. Out. Now, as you hear me say often, I, I don't make the news, I just report it. If I could rewrite the Bible, I'd make that different. I would. I would, I would change that. Now, some, many churches across America have chosen just to ignore that part of the Bible and say, well, it's, uh, it was cultural at the time. No. You can't do that with the Word of God. You either say it's literal or it's not literal. I've I've got the script and I've got I've actually got the video made and now I just got to dress it up and put it on the web where where I, I talk about the fact that the Pew poll has shown that only 24% of people believe that the Bible is the literal word of God and it's diminishing every year and they get hung up on things they say well yeah no it couldn't be that that can't be. And, and they don't recognize that reading it out of context makes you think a lot of things must not be literal because you're reading it out of context. You know, when, when, when my wife says, don't touch the pan. Well, that's not all the time because I, I, don't, I don't even want to touch the pan unless I, seem to, unless I think there's food in it. I mean, you know, that's, there was a context of that don't touch the pan. Right? Well, there's a context to everything written in the Word of God. And when people take it out of the context, with even, uh, with, by the way, even some of the best Christians take Scripture out of context a lot. Okay? But uh, what was it? Uh, oh, Amy posted something. I liked it. Let me see. Um, a verse quoter ought to be a context thinker. Did I get it right? Did I get it right? That's close enough. You get what I'm saying? If you're going to quote a verse, quote it in context. And uh, many people don't. Well, if the way to sin is death, what do we do about that? Well, here it is. Romans 5, 8. God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners deserving of death, Christ, died for us, died in our place. So there's this substitute for this spiritual death. And then to top it off then, Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you're talked in, if you're coaxed into calling upon the name of the Lord, and it's not the Holy Spirit, that won't take. When you are drawn, John 6, 44, by the Holy Spirit to say, I want to trust you as my personal Savior, the words don't really matter. What matters is the, uh, is the, not the spock mind meld, but what happens is the meld that we have with our spirit and God's spirit where we are born again and dwelled with the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. These people, that's what they had in common. They had in common the fact that they had all, they were bound together, 
They had lots of different beliefs about things because they'd come out of a Jewish background. But what they did have in common is they had all trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now, the local assembly, by the way, is not the church. The local assembly, here we are at South Point Bible Fellowship, we are a subset of the body of Christ. So, think of the body of Christ, huge circle, and South Point Bible Fellowship within the body of Christ is a subset of believers. Now, uh, can you guarantee me that everybody that goes to a local church is saved? So, some people can go to a local church and actually not be a member of the body of Christ. And by the way, that's on us. I mean, think about it. That's on us. Because our message of salvation ought to be so clear that the Holy Spirit can use that and cause that person to either say, I, I, I want to trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, or say, I'm never setting foot in that church ever again. But it ought to be decision time. And maybe I haven't been clear enough about that. But we're a body of believers. And not only so, but notice he says they were all one heart and one soul. Now you get it, right? One heart and one soul. You have this common bond. And the common bond is we love Jesus. We love the Lord. And there were thousands of them here at this early church and their common bond was they love the Lord. So we naturally we expect our our folks to be one heart and one soul. We expect that to be what characterizes us. We expect that to be that as we fellowship, we're fellowshipping around the basis that God is our God and Jesus is our Savior because we personally have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Yeah, but it always, mm, there are wrinkles to that. And, and one of the wrinkles is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We've actually looked at uh, that in Bible study on Wednesday. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 starts out in uh, verse 1 with Paul rebuking the church of Corinth. Church of Corinth was a mess. If you ever see a church named Corinth, there is not a Bible reader in the building. Because the church of Corinth was the worst church in the Bible. And, uh, and Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians to them, uh, um, rebuking them for all kinds of things. But in the fifth chapter, he was rebuking them because they had a man who was having sexual relations with his stepmother. And the church said, I'm not meddling, it's okay. Yeah, it's not my business. And Paul said, it's to your business. And, and by the way, it is our business. It absolutely is our business. Because we are, we are knit together. We're supposed to be of one heart and one soul. And Paul says, you've ignored this. And in chapter, in chapter 5, verse 5, he says, I've judged this already, even though I'm not there. You need to either, he needs to get right, or you put him out of the church. See, drive him out of the church. He can't stay. Well, then uh, he says, now I've written to you not to keep company with anybody that's, you know, got these problems, these outward sins. But he says, not just anybody. Uh, else you'd have to go out of the world. I mean, work at your work. Work at, you, you, I mean, you gotta, you got to hang with people that don't share your values if you're going to work in this, in this day and age, and back then as well. But then he defines this in verse 11. He says, Now I have written to you not to keep company if any man who is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or railer, mean person all the time, or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such a one 
known not to estel, or eat, or have fellowship with. Now, there's some distinction there. He says, if any man who is called a brother, what's our church? Body of brothers and sisters in Christ. If anyone proclaims to be a brother and sister or sister in Christ, then if that person is known to be practicing a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner, the model in verse 5 was to put him out of the church. But there's more. Once you put them out and they are in that conduct, don't even have fellowship with them. Now, by the way, I dealt with a family oh, it's probably 10 years ago where uh, a couple in the family, uh, they decided they, they didn't get married and, and they started living together. It's very widely done today, but not so much, it's probably 15 years ago, not so much back then. And so the women were on one side, well, we need to be nice to them, and the men on the other side were saying, no, here's what Scripture says. No, we got to shame them. we got to make them realize this is not okay. And so you had the women just, oh, yeah, we've got to love them, and the men said, no. Oh. And it was, it was weird to be in the middle of that. And, and all I could do was just say, you know what? I realize it's family. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell all of you. Here's what the scripture says. And I took them to 1 Corinthians 5. And I said, now, deal with it. And so the men took their stand. The women took their stand. You know what happened? It wasn't but a few weeks before the couple got married. And everybody was okay. It's hard inside a family. I, I know families right now that are split up because of, of that kind of activity within the family. It's hard, but but Paul's really clear right there. A co- fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, those are public, public activities. I, I know we're all sinners. As a matter of fact, one of the technologies that scares me to death, every month I'm reading that they've come a little closer to being able to read your thoughts. I hope I die first. (laughs) If you could read my thoughts, I wouldn't be your preacher. I mean, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that everything I think doesn't come out verbally. Wow. Would that be scary or what? I tell, uh, and I've told my granddaughters this, and I told my daughter this, and and uh, I've been, you know, I've been pretty pretty clear about it. I mean, you know, isn't sin sin? Well, yeah, but but sometimes restraint is really the thing. And um, I told my granddaughters, I said, look here, here's something you need to understand. And you're going to hear me say this over and over again through the years. And I I say it to them over and over and over again. And when they started saying it to them, you know, back before they even quite understood what I was talking about. And you may disagree with me here. The women may disagree. Men, if you're honest, you won't disagree with me. And you'll defend me when you get home. (laughs) Here's what I tell my daughters, my granddaughters and my daughter. All men... Are dirt bags. <laughs> All right, now women, you're looking, you're saying, no, not my husband. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> if you knew, if you knew what men think when they see a woman, you'd say, you've got to be kidding me. No, I mean, I mean, it's, and... And so, and so I, I just, just had this talk with my youngest one the other day. I said, now, you know, when you go out with a guy, he can come from a Christian family, he can be one of the best Christians you ever met, but there's one thing going through his mind. Uh, and, and, and that's, why? Because well, we're sinners by nature. 
Restraint, 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 restraint. The Holy Spirit gives us restraint. That's what makes us different. So what about the person that ignores the restraint of the Holy Spirit and just lets it all hang out? Well, that's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. A person that's a fornicator, that's pretty obvious. Uh, you may not know about it, but if you know about it, or an extortioner, uh, just think about the list. All of them public. When you know that's going on, they can't stay in your church in good fellowship. Now, uh, interesting thing about, about extortioners, they don't actually have a national movement trying to recruit other extortioners. Well, that may be robocalls. I don't know. But they, they, they don't... Have you ever met an adulterer that was proud of it? They say, hey, I'm an adulterer. And I've joined a movement called Adulterers International. No, there's... there's okay, Hollywood, yeah. There, there's, there's not a movement. Now, um, I'm not responsible for anything anybody does unless it becomes overt. I can't read your mind. I can't, I can't determine how saved or unsaved I think you are. And let's be frank here for just a moment. Is Frank here? Okay. Don't tell him I'm mentioning. Let's be frank here for just a minute. You can't even be sure I'm saved. You can't be sure. You don't know my mind. Our thoughts are our thoughts, at least for the time being. Our thoughts are our thoughts. But when sin becomes overt, God calls upon the church to identify it and to deal with it. So that's why... I single this out. Does your church ban gay marriage? Then it should start paying taxes. I never actually read Splinter, but it's a left-wing publication. But you know, I picked one article because it had the nice picture there. But there were literally dozens of articles saying the same thing because let me tell you something, they're getting ready to come take our tax exempt site. Now, I've been saying this for 30 years. They're going to take our tax exempt site. Uh, the, you know what I mean? They're going to take our tax exempt status if we don't endorse gay lifestyle. As a matter of fact, the EEOC, people don't, a lot of people don't understand the EEOC, um, Equal, Opportun Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's a, uh, an agency, the president appoints the leadership. Congress doesn't get to vote on what they decree to be uh, discrimination at all. They just add it if they want to. If you challenge it in court, it could go all the way up to uh, the Supreme Court if you have uh, $10 million to spend on, on legal fees. So with uh, millions of dollars they bring to bear, on a baker, on someone. You, you just usually have to, because you can't financially defend yourself, you just generally have to fold and comply. Well, look what they've added. The EEOC is responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate against a job applicant or an employee because of the person's race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy. Gender identity, that's been added in recent years under the Obama administration. Wasn't there before. And sexual orientation. National origin, age if you're over 40, disability or genetic information. Now, did Congress vote on putting the other... No, they didn't vote on it. The agency just did it. Under the Obama administration, they added the, uh, the uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And, and, and they're now, because that is the rule of law. Congress didn't make it. 
It's the rule of law because the EEOC says it is. You got a few million dollars to defend yourself? Good luck on that. And so, when they say you can't discriminate in 2012, they went after the, uh, the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church that had a school. They let a lady go because she violated the church covenant. It's really an interesting story. It's pretty involved. And this little bitty attorney, you know, storefront attorney, they had a child in the school. The school only had like 30 students. He went all the way to the Supreme Court and defended it before the Supreme Court. And because they called their teachers ministers, so this wouldn't have worked with a cafeteria lady, or because they called their teachers ministers, the ministerial exception from the First Amendment of the Constitution, all nine Supreme Court justices said, a church can do whatever they want to with their ministers. Now, not a cafeteria worker, not a janitor, not someone who takes care of the children after school, but ministers. And so now, in Christian schools, there is a big push on advice from counsel to make sure that everybody that works at your church and school is considered a minister. Because I'll tell you something. They are coming after us. The adulterers aren't coming after us. I don't think. I can't even think of a single adulterer organization. But the LGBTQ community is on the assault against Christians. Now, we know this, right? I'm not telling anything you don't know. So, so they reserve the right to beat our brains out. Second, Lady Karen Pence. You read about this about a month ago. January 16th. She took her old job back teaching art at the Christian school in Indiana. And the media and the LGBTQ community, they have had a fit. And uh, here's the Time article. Uh, is facing controversy for accepting a part-time teaching job at a private Christian school that does not admit LGBTQ students or hire LGBTQ employees. That school is now on the map. They will do whatever they can to destroy that school. Now, the tweets that came out after this, a bunch of, of news articles and a bunch of news outlets. And then the tweets started coming in. Why not serve at a school that welcomes everyone? Not a week passes without some reminder that the Pence's view LB, LGBTQ people as second-class citizens, based on the article that week. The Pence has never seen, this is the Human Rights Campaign, big organization promoting LGBTQ uh, practices. The Pence has never seemed to miss an opportunity to show their public service only extends to some. I mean, his wife can't even teach in a Christian school. A Christian school that all of us would approve of the values of the school. This sends a terrible message. This is the ACLU. They got deep pockets. Do we want to live in a country with leaders who are willing to disavow LGBTQ youth? Hey, they're coming after us. They are. And then there's this. I don't know if you saw this. In a speech, Joe Biden was talking about uh, Mike Pence. And he said he's a decent guy. Cynthia Nixon, who used to be one of the four on uh, Sex and the City, who used to watch that? 
<laughs> almost, almost got you. <laughs> she was one of the four promiscuous gals on Sex in the City. Now she ran for governor of New York, and uh, she'll keep running till she she's openly homosexual. And so when Joe Biden said that Mike Pence was a decent guy, she tweeted out and told him that is that is. Uh, uh, with all of this anti-LGBTQ politics. And then Joe Biden replied there on Twitter, there's nothing decent about being anti-LGBTQ. And that includes the vice president. I mean, that's how intimidating the gay community is right now. They are coming after us. It used to be the Russians, but no, now it's this community. GLAD, G-L-A-A-D. All right, let me finish preaching, okay? G-L-A-A-D, GLAD, the uh, National LGBTQ Rights Organization. They've got, over here on the side, this is... Uh, this is the people, these are the conservatives that they consider to be anti-LGBTQ. And so for everybody that wants to attack them, they have a profile for each one showing how they are against, giving you information on what they've done that offends the LGBT community. And here's the list that you can't read right there, right next to it. Look at the people on the list. And you'll notice as we go down through this list, you see a lot of politicians. Uh, you see uh, people you know. No liberals on here. Jerry Falwell Jr. is on there. These are Nikki Haley's on there. These are the people that they say must be stopped. And if you want to go after them, we've developed a profile on these people that you can read to gather your information to go after them. And notice what's last. The Evangelical Leadership Dinner. So, the extortioners don't have a national organization to come after us. The adulterers don't as far as I know. But the homosexuals do. And they hate what we stand for. And they are going to they are going to muscle their way in as they tried in 2012. But they are going to continue to use intimidation tactics. They're going to boycott. They're going to do everything they can as their power increases. They're going to do everything they can to shut down our tax exempt status and to force us to integrate into our congregation. I see it as a problem, but let me move on. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. I like that. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of people were bemoaning the um, simplified tax structure. For me, the only loan I have is a 2.625% loan. My itemized deductions don't come up to maybe six, $7,000, and now with the tax, uh, simplified tax, I get 26, what, 26.6, you say, J.D.? I get 26.6 standard deduction. Because I'm old. I love it. I love, I love it. But, but I realize that some of you, <laughs> okay, I'm a deadbeat. Some of you are going to be paying my way from this time. I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh, now, what I really would prefer, though, is to have, uh, well, all your stuff. I'd like to have really all your stuff. I'm looking around here and I'm thinking if we share, if we, if we share, if we do what they did, have all things in common, I think I come out pretty good. 
Now, why don't why 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 don't we why don't we have that? Now, remember the situation. They thought that in just a few weeks, maybe months. We're going to start the kingdom. We don't need this stuff. What we need to do is we need to get to this task that Jesus talked about. We need to go evangelize. Therefore, let's pool our resources. You ever lived in a commune? I have. It's called Marine Corps Boot Camp. Where you share everything. The day the drill instructor came down the line with a jar of honey for each line, we, we lined up across the little, uh, what we call the street. It's only about eight feet wide. And uh, the drill instructor gave all of the guys whose letter began with an A, name began with an A, and then N over here. I was a T. I was always at the end. When they lined up alphabet, T's are always at the end. When they lined up by height, five eighths always at the end. <laughs> I was always at the end. One spoon. We're getting ready to go do the competition for the PFT. And everybody's going to take a spoonful of honey off this spoon. I had no choice because they told us all things were common. I mean, everything was common. We didn't do anything by ourselves. We went everywhere as a group. I hated it, but these people, they loved having everything in common because they only were thinking, they were only thinking, it's right around the corner. Let's pull our resources. Let's get it done. I mean, let's just, let's just go for this. Now, you know, a marriage is like a commune, isn't it? You share everything, except maybe a toothbrush. You share a toothbrush? Okay, so everything. Now, now, a commune of more than two is like the Manson family, so that's that's an extreme. But, but you know, we we are familiar with communal living to some degree. But these were all the people they they're they're actually sharing everything because there's a ministry. When I got in the Marine Corps, they made me send my Bible home. I had a, a Bible that sat in my pocket that that had all of the Old and New Testament. And they said, "You don't need that. We give you a Bible." They gave me a New Testament. I had to send it home. Now, the difference, by the way, is this is voluntary. Government wants to do that to us. The Green New Deal wants to do that to us. But what they had was voluntary. The kibbutz over in, uh, over in Israel, those, that's communal living, but people joined that voluntarily. But this was something they did voluntarily. It wasn't pushed on them. And it was because of the urgency of the moment. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Power, right there, comes from the Greek word dynamis, which we get our word dynamite from. And the power of the early church was just known everywhere. The grace was great upon them all. Grace is actually the word for uh, charis, grace, free gift. Free gift is like unnecessary, isn't it? If it's a gift, it's free, right? And so the grace can be taken in several different contexts, favor or sometimes a present. It's used 155 times in the New Testament. But here's the definition of that grace because it says actually gar is the word for. So in the Greek it begins, for there was not anyone among them who lacked. That was the grace part. They shared. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things they were sold, that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and distributed each one as he had need. Again, I like that idea. But we don't find any New Testament churches that do that, right? So context is important here. It was the urgency of the moment, right? It was the urgency. We don't need this stuff because we're starting the kingdom. And Joseph, which is Joseph, was also named Barnabas. We're, we're done here, okay? Just work with me here. By the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement or exhortation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Later, he went on the first missionary journey with Paul. 
And the incident here turns out to be kind of bizarre when we get to chapter 5 because you got these two people, a charming couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who saw all the attention that Barnabas got here on that day when he did that, and they said, let's do that. And it turned out to be a, a tragic story. If you like tragic stories, come next week. <laughs> the church was founded on the principle of believers with one mind gathering together. Let's stand, please. Sorry it took so long.